right, we should be starting the meeting here in just a second. Just waiting to get the verification. It is going. Yep, we're live. Cool. Hope everyone's doing all right. So we're going to be doing our uh, week two uh, live session for shading and lighting two. And it's going to be a couple different things we're going to be going over today. Uh, mainly what I want to do is uh, talk about the 2.3 activity and show you guys a couple of ways that we can uh, manipulate our textures and materials back inside of Maya. So this one's going to be kind of interesting. And it's, um, it's basically building off of some things that we've done uh, the previous week, like, uh, like 1.3. So in 1.3 is the first time that you guys had applied any textures to materials. So you had you know, just found a couple things online. Uh, you connected them to the, you know, the, uh, the telescope wood or the, the wood material that's on the, the doors and the windows. This time we're going to be using the textures that you guys created uh, from Photoshop. I want to go over a few different ways that we can also uh, manipulate the textures, like scaling UVs, um, uh, do some basic color correction, and just kind of do an overall um, overview, I guess, of how the hypershade works. I think the hypershade and the UV editor are two of these little parts of Maya which maybe don't quite make a whole lot of sense yet. Um, but we're going to go into that today and uh, just talk about how all that stuff works. And in the process, like we're going to go through pretty much everything here with 2.3. So I think overall this is just going to be a pretty helpful um, overview of how this entire project is going to work. So it should clear, uh, clear up a lot of the questions. All right, so let's, uh, let's jump in here. What I'm going to do, I can see where I left off here. Because I know we did a little bit of this last time. Um, Okay, all I want to do, I need to copy over a couple textures uh, from like 2.1. That way we have those guys all set. Okay, so in the environment project in Source Images, hopefully what you guys have been doing is you've started to set up your own folders in the Source Images folder. So again, really important that everything we're doing is in the Maya project. So inside of Source Images, we have all these different textures. Uh, we have, you know, different folders, face, wall, pedestal, all that stuff. And uh, I'm going to start bringing these over to my new project over here for the lecture. So let's grab, uh, you haven't done the vase yet, but we do have the wall, uh, pedestal, and balcony. So we're just going to copy those, put those over here. Okay. So let's jump out of that and... We're going to go inside of Maya, and I'm just going to simply set the project to my uh, folder. So let's set, oh, wrong folder. Set, there we go. There's a folder in the folder. Set scenes. Here's where we left off last time, part one. All right, and what I'm going to do is just look through the camera. We're going to start a render and just see you know, what this currently looks like. So what do we do? Now, we actually didn't get too much accomplished. Uh, we, uh, well, we did a lot, but really just got like the wood texture connected to here. Uh, if I click on the material and just show you what this looks like over here under Colonial Maple, you can see we've got the weight pulled down. Uh, I've got the file connected. We didn't really do anything to the primary specular properties, but uh, it is there. We might tweak that a little bit. So. First thing I'm going to do is let's just like really quickly just knock out the pedestal. The pedestal is going to be pretty easy. It's not really a whole lot to it. It's going to be very similar to what we did before. So I'm just going to turn this off for a second. And uh, we'll kind of go through the process of assigning a material one more time, but a little bit faster since we've already done this previously. So remember, the goal here would be I have two pedestals on each side, and we've made textures for them. So the material I make should probably, it really should be one material for both objects. So I'm just gonna click through here, I'm holding shift. So by holding shift, I'm adding other selections. So I'm holding shift again, click, click, click. All right, so we get all that selected. You can also see right here in the outliner, I can literally just click, click on the groups. That's basically gonna do the same thing. So we got it all selected. And uh, in the render man shelf right here, we can right click. And then we've got our option to make a Pixar surface. So I'm just going to click on that. And you can see it has done it. Uh, now the way to kind of find the material is if you click on any object, 
remember, you can always find the material in the attribute editor. But one of the, one of the really big things here is we want to start getting you all much more comfortable with the hypershade. So the hypershade is this button right here. Okay, so it's going to open it up. And um, inside of here, I'm hoping most of you have already done this because um, I've talked about this with you kind of previously, and I brought this up in Shading and Lighting 1. If opening the hypershade causes your Maya to crash, um, reach out to me. There's a video way back in the very first activity in 1.1. 1 .1, uh, it's called Important uh, Maya Crashing Fix. Go back to activity 1.1 1 .1 and watch the video. But there's a couple things you have to do in the hypershade as far as turning buttons off to make sure it does not crash. So it you should not run into any issues when you're in here. But if you are running into problems, reach out immediately so we can just make sure that uh, you're able to move forward with the project smoothly. So what I want you to notice is that the Hypershade um, has two main components. We have our browser and we have the node graph. And there are a lot of other things that come with the Hypershade. There's a creation window that's usually over here. There's a, a property editor. That thing's over here somewhere typically. Material viewer, that guy's usually up here. So there are a lot of, a lot of parts. I just don't like half this stuff because I think it's a waste of space. So we're going to close all that stuff down. If you want to bring back any of the sections, you always can. But I kind of like to leave my hypershade uh, pretty much down to like just a very kind of bare bones setup. Just my different materials and nodes at the top, mainly this section. And then I like to see the materials graphed out down here at the bottom. Now, the thing you'll notice is that when we assigned the material, because we had all of them selected, this is called Pixar Surface 2. And in the Hypershade, you can see, here's a list of all the materials, uh, mainly these guys right here. This one is a Lambert that just comes with, the, with every file. But those four, those are all render man materials. This is the gray one that's assigned to everything. That's the uh, metal on like the bolts and hinges. Uh, this is the one on the doors and windows. This guy, though, is going to be the pedestal. So I immediately want to rename it. Now, I could go over here and just, uh, you know, rename it this way. But what I'm going to do is a little shortcut. We're going to hold down Control and just double click on that node or just the name uh, of the node right here in the Hypershade. So if I do Control and just double click on it, you can see this little rename node thing just pops up. It's a little shortcut. And we're going to call this Pedestal Material. Hit enter, it's been renamed. Exactly the same thing as you renaming it over here. So it doesn't really matter which way you, you do it. Now, first thing I want to do right off the bat is let's get the texture connected. So we've kind of done this before. This is color. We have this little connection button over here to the right. It's a little checker bo uh, box. That is going to allow us to connect in a new file. So by default, because all these are selected, we're seeing this massive list of like 2D textures, 3D textures, um, some environment textures. Uh, the one we need is the regular old Maya file. So we're going to click right there. Now you can see as soon as you do that, that the attribute editor does pop it up automatically because we're currently selecting it once you create it. So if I wanted to, I could click in here, just go to the folder. And uh, since this is going to be for the, uh, the pedestal, we can go to the folder here. And there's my save texture for the one I did. Right? So you guys probably already have this stored somewhere. So we're going to click on that, open. And you can see the path, right? Now, something kind of interesting here I want to point out is notice how the path name starts at source images. It's not starting at, like, when you look at your, um, like, your Explorer window, see how it's this long list of, like, this PC, documents, LA, you know, whatever your folders are. This has, really doesn't show any of that. So it's because we set the project, and so it understands that everything starts in the project. It doesn't need to go through all this other crap to find it. It just says, hey, we know where the project's located because we set it first. Let's immediately jump in the source images and then find it from there. So it does cut down on that path name quite a bit. Um, now, it should already be working. So what we're going to do is go back to the camera, and we're just going to turn on the render. And it's probably going to look a little weird at first. Oh, it actually loaded pretty quick. Never mind or it'll load instantly. Um, like last time when we did the doors and the windows, uh, it kind of went through this weird phase where it was kind of like an odd bluish gray color. It was like a kind of a giant R displaying on it. And that was RenderMan trying to convert our texture over to a dot text format. And sometimes that does take a few seconds depending on uh, how big the texture file is. But 
it's here. You can see it's, it's working pretty well. Uh, if you guys wanted to, you know, remember, you can always take the perspective camera, you know, move it up close, do something like this. We can start a render and just see what it looks like uh, much, much closer. So I could turn this on, and I do have my viewport uh, set to 50%. So it's, uh, the resolution's been cut down quite a bit. And I can turn on the crop, and I'm just going to draw over this and disable it. So I'm just turning off the crop because if this thing is running, every time you click, see how I'm, it still thinks I'm trying to draw the crop window. So I'm just going to plop it down over the thing I want. It updates really quickly inside that area. Turn it off, and we're good. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because I want to spend just a little time balancing the material properties super quick uh, while I'm, I'm looking at it. Now, this is where we get into some different ways to figure out how we access this stuff. So. Now, if I click on it, like you can see, I can get to the material, right? And then how do I get to the texture file? Well, if I click on the object, then click on the material, now I can see color. And over to the right, there's that button we hit earlier, but it's changed to like a little, this is called a, an, an input button. I can click on it, and it takes me to whatever the input is. So because we made the file node, it's saying instead of you, like the checker box was me like creating a new one, but because there's already something connected into color, if I hit it, it just jumps over to whatever was connected. That's that file node that we just made earlier. But I also want to show you a different way to do this. And this is kind of the main, I think, theme for today is I want to get you guys a lot more comfortable with this idea of it being displayed as a node graph. And I've talked to a couple of you guys one-on-one uh, -on -one about this. So a node graph is uh, it's very similar to Nuke. It's how Maya uh, connects different materials and nodes and textures together. Now, currently, you can see there is something in here. And by the way, to move around, it's pretty straightforward. If you do Alt-Middle, is side-to-side. Alt-Right is back and forth. Okay, so but just hold, as you hold down Alt, Middle, and Right, you can kind of navigate around here pretty quickly. Now, currently, I'm seeing the file node and this 2D placement node that sort of goes with the file but I don't see anything else. It's just sort of floating in space. What we're going to do is clear this out. Oh, hey, Josh. Welcome to the party. Um, so what we're going to do is clear this thing out. So at the top, above that, you can see there's a whole bunch of buttons here. We've got this one that's called Clear Graph. And I'm just going to hit that to just remove the nodes. Now, that's not deleting anything. The, the texture file is still there. That is me just removing it from the node graph so I can you know, load some different things in. So if you look at the render, it's not like the texture file's gone. I just am wiping it out of this little box at the bottom. Um, now what I'm going to do is graph uh, the material. So to do that, you can see that we made our pedestal material, and what we're going to do is hold down right mouse button, and we're going to talk about all these uh, quite a bit today. Hold down right mouse button and gesture down to graph network. Click and at release, and we've got the material. This is called a shading group. This is the file node. That's the 2D placement for the file node. So this is actually what the entire network looks like currently. So I want you guys to notice how these are connected. So um, all of you guys have used Nuke to some extent at this point. You remember how in Nuke, it was sort of like an upside down Christmas tree where there were a bunch of nodes at the top that were all sort of funneling together. And by the time you got to the bottom, uh, you were kind of spitting out one image. So Nuke was a very like top down uh, kind of uh, node connection setup. This generally is going to read left to right. So things start on the left. They start connecting and moving data to the right until they eventually end up somewhere. This is pretty much the final stopping point here is the material. Things are connecting into the material. And I want you to notice here over the attributes how uh, when we connected that file into color, see how that slider is black? Like I can't, it's not actually black, but I can't connect anything into it. Well, it's black because this is now a disabled attribute. Like you can't modify it with a color because something's going into it. And you can kind of read what's happening here just by looking at the setup. There's a file node is taking the color. So out color simply means it's taking the RGB channels from the file. That's our, our color, right? And connecting that into the RGB channels of the diffuse color. 
that is diffuse color. So it's, it's visually showing you what we were doing over here, but this is on, kind of on the back end what it really looks like as our node set up. So what you were doing here in the hypershade before looks like this, uh, or what you're doing in the attribute editor before looks like this in the hypershade. So color to color. Okay, now uh, we're going to come back to that in a little bit. For now, what I want to do is just play around with the intensity just a, a little more and then work on my primary specular properties. So what I'm kind of noticing for me is that I think this might be just a little bright and washed out, and you guys may have a couple of textures that are kind of similar to that. So if I bring down diffuse gain in the material, you'll see this darkens the texture, right? And there's not really any right or wrong answer at this point. Um, so I'm just going to bring it down a little bit. Maybe we'll say, I don't know, 0.8, which is about like 80% of its original intensity. And zero will just completely, you know, turn it black. So uh, you can kind of figure out how bright you want it. We'll kind of stick with that. And then the big reason why it doesn't quite feel interesting to me at the moment is the primary specular properties. So this is where we get the highlight specular reflections. So what we can do is we're going to take, we're going to recreate what's called the Fresnel reflection. We're going to take face color, we're just going to boost it up a little bit. Okay, you can see, I want to, let me crank it up so you can actually see this a little bit better. See how we're kind of getting all these um, uh, like shiny sections where this is now reflecting the floor. You can see this reflecting lights. It almost has like a metallic look to it. So the face color is very, very touchy. It uh, does not take much for this to like uh, overwhelm uh, the shot with reflections. So typically this guy is not going to be very strong. Just like boost it up a little bit, get some highlights on there. Okay, so I can already see they're forming. I might go just a little brighter. And what I want to do is then boost up the edge color. Now edge color is going to be exactly what it sounds like on the edge or generally the silhouette of what we're looking at. So if I boost this up, we'll, this one's a little harder to see. Um, yeah, it's probably not the best example with this shape, but it's kind of adding more detail on the, uh, the silhouette here. And usually what I would do with edge is I'd leave it right around halfway up for most of my materials, unless I'm getting into like mirrors or, uh, or metallic surfaces. The last thing we want to do is get the roughness figured out. So roughness is going to be how sharp, like wet or dry, I want the reflection to look. Now, right now, I think it feels pretty polished, right? It has a very um, crisp, tight reflection. If I go higher, Watch what that does. I can kind of see it down here actually pretty well. So it's getting a bit more matte as I keep going up, drier and drier. Eventually it's going to look very dry where it's almost like dusty. But if it's way lower, you can see we get much tighter highlights like this, fairly dark around it. So all you're doing is basically blurring or sharpening the specular reflection. What I think I could do and I'm going to do a layered reflection for this to make it kind of interesting. Um, I'm going to put this up a little bit higher, maybe let's do like 0.4. So we can see it's kind of in between everything. It's sort of dry. And then we're going to come down, in this case, to clear coat. Now, I talked a little bit about clear coat back in the first week um, uh, when we were kind of we were doing like car paint in one of the videos. But... I want to bring this up again because I think this is one of those materials where it might look kind of cool with a clear coat. Because what I kind of imagine, if this is a marble and, you know, I don't know what type of stone this would be on the top, like a slate or something. It could be another granite, possibly. But the stone has its own reflection. But then I'm kind of imagining there's also going to be this sort of secondary polish uh, on top of that. So we're going to treat this as the stone's reflection. The clear coat is our shiny polish. So to set this up, I'm going to do basically the same thing with face and edge color. You can tell they're about the same. But the roughness is going to be lower. And so I want to see if you can see that. It's kind of hard to make it out, but there's basically a tighter highlight that's sitting on top of a broader highlight. If I pull that back, you might be able to see it. Yeah, it's, it's very hard to see that. 
but there essentially are two different reflections stacking together, a softer one and the drier polish on top of it. And you guys can kind of play around with that when you're doing it. Um, just look through your camera, get a feel for like how shiny it is. I think the biggest mistake that most people make is they just end up cranking face color up too much and it kind of causes the um, entire material to just look a little washed out and very uh, uh, plasticky basically. So very easy though. And this is basically done, right? We got that little pedestal set up. And once I get this finished, because this material is driving the other one, I'm pretty confident the other one is going to be just fine. So this one material just fixed both. Let's kill the render. Let's back up. All right. We're good there. Now what we're going to do next is hop into, let's do, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> oh, need some water. Let's focus on the wall for this one. I'm going to show you a bunch of really interesting things with the wall. Uh, actually, no, before I do that, I might do the. All right, yeah, sorry, change of plans. I am going to do something with the balcony first real fast. So I think I'm good with the pedestal. I want to remove this from the graph. So right here is our clear graph. Let's just wipe that out for a second. Again, it's not deleting it. We're just removing it visually from here because I want to move on to a different material. So we're going to kind of do something a little different. I'm going to intentionally not apply the material the right way because I want you guys to see how we fix issues like this. I'm going to do the balcony material, but all I'm going to do is click on just this guy. And then I'm going to go up here. I'm going to right click and make a Pixar surface. So this is still kind of the same that we just did, right? We're clicking on an object, right clicking, making a material. You can see it's here again in the hyper shade. You can also find that material we made, Pixar Surface 3, Control, double click, let's rename it. We'll call this uh, Balcony Material. Oh, uh, it's also here now because I, this was, it, when I made it, it just popped in the hypershade. But uh, it's there. Now, the problem I'm running into, let me just change this to a different color so you can clearly see this. We're going to put like some weird pink on it. Uh, let's look through the camera because I want you guys to see where this currently shows up. Okay, I had one object selected. I made my material, right, and it assigned it to whatever I had selected. Cool. We got all this little interesting magenta. This is my finest work. The problem is after going through the documentation or just kind of realizing what we're supposed to do with that material and texture, I have now kind of figured out after the fact that I should have had this material on these pieces. Now I'm going gonna, gonna to make another bad decision. So now we're going to go like, oh shoot, uh, that was also supposed to be that kind of pink color. So I'm going to click on these guys and then do it again. We have another one, right? Here's Pixar Surface 4. And I'm, I'm not going to rename this one, but we'll just... You know, pick another, well, there's that same color again that's showing up in my color history, so I can just pick it, and I'll render it. So I'm just basically doing the same thing again. It's, and you're like, yay, we got it on there, and we have pink, and then we're like, oh, it should have been on the post, and we do it again, right? We can kind of keep going through this process of just selecting different things over and over again. If I dig through the, the groups in here, you can find where all this stuff's located. Like, here's post group two, there's one, three, four. I can click on all these. Let's do it even one more time. Uh, let's even get the ground in here. Right click, Pixar surface. Here's Pixar surface five. We'll change it. Another pink. That's, oh, now we're getting a lot of pink bounce light. You can see it's even uh, bouncing up here into the, uh, the doorway. So, pink everywhere. Great job, right? This looks amazing. It's even reflecting off the pedestal now. So here's why I just want you guys to start thinking about what we're doing here with this. We have made three different materials. They're assigned to different scattered pieces. They all have the same color, so visually they still look the same. So that's not really the issue. Here's where we get to the problem. Imagine you are working on this project for a client or you're at a studio and you're still trying to work out some of the previous work. Maybe they're playing around with different textures and color palettes. You haven't really quite settled on the final look. And I don't know why, by the way, why anybody would have this be the final look. But we're going to pretend like someone told you to do this. And 
your art director says, oh, well, hey, you know what? I actually don't think I like the pink, which is not a surprise. I want to change this to green. So what happens now? Well, you're now clicking on a material, and you're like, okay, I got to make it green. He doesn't like the pink, so we'll go in there and change it. And now what are you doing? Now you realize that, oh, wait a minute, that was one of them, but there's another one that also needs to be green. And we just kind of keep repeating this over and over. Now that's green. Now this guy has to be green. I know it's not taking that long right now because I only made three materials and I'm, you know, I'm just, you know, quickly clicking through it. But this is going to become a bigger issue the more and more you start breaking things up. Now there are going to be some situations where you really do want the two materials to be different, completely separated, because you may want them to react to light the different way. You want one to be very shiny. Maybe the other one is the same texture, but it's dry and like beat up. But th in this case, we don't really want to do that. I want to have that one material on everything. So our tr thing we have to figure out here is how do we get this material we've already made on all the other objects? So there's a few ways to do it. You could, if you wanted to, if you can find a quick way to select everything, like this about the railing square group, I could simply click on that, and then in the hypershade, when you identify what material it should be using, which is balcony material, that's the first one we made, if I hold my right mouse button down, I can do a sign material to selection, right? And if I do it, it's now on there. So if I click on any of these pieces and start navigating over, Balcony material is now on there. It's not, I think that would have been Pixar Surface 4, I think was the one I had on there before. So I just swapped out the material. There is a better way to do this though, uh, if you don't like clicking through all this. Sometimes you just know that like, everything that's using this material should actually use this material. How do I do a material swap? So here's our big trick of the day. If anytime you wanna swap out materials very quickly, what I'm going to do is I want you to kind of see this in the viewport. Um, so four, four, four probably doesn't have any. There we go. My computer just freaked out. We good computer? Yeah, we cool. Okay, we're cool. Uh, I'm going to hold down right mouse button on Pixar Surface 4, and I'm going to pick Select Objects. And you'll notice. Nothing happened because I already got rid of this guy. So let's move on to Pixar Surface 5. I'm going to do right click, select objects, click. Now notice how that automatically selected every object that we had already assigned this material to, which means all I've got to do now is hold down right mouse button over the pedestal because everything's selected, go up, assign material to selection, boom, done. So now if I right click on the pedestal and pick select objects, notice how pretty much every, oh wow, why, why did I do pedestal? Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh geez, Jared, you've done it now. <laughs> Think about what you're doing before you do it. Oh geez, that was not supposed to be pedestal. That was supposed to be, let's back up. You, I think you guys know what I was trying to do. Let me go back, okay. Let's try it again. Right click on Pixar Surface 5. We've selected it. Right click on balcony material, not pedestal. Assign material to selection. So now if I right click on the balcony and say select everything, it all lights up. I messed up and put the pedestal on that. That would have not have been good. So now everything has it. So the, if I change the, uh, the balcony now, everything updates. It's a material swap. So, uh, I'm, I'm going to get rid of uh, four. Let's just delete these two because they don't need to be there. On five, I'm just going to turn this to some other random color. We'll just do that. That's fine. And uh, I'll show you how to swap them back and forth much quicker. So I have a green material and a blue material. How do we do it? Okay. It's currently using balcony. I want it to use Pixar Surface 5. So here's how quick it is once you get better at this. Right mouse button. Select. Right mouse button. Assign. It's already done. So it's select, then assign. And now we go backwards. Right click, select, 
right click, assign, and now it got flipped back the other way. It's a really simple thing It's in the hypershade that not a lot of people really even realize is there, uh, but that little right click option on the materials is an awesome way to like make your selections much, much more efficient. So you're not actually going through there and like single clicking through every material, trying to assign it one by one. It takes way too much time. Now, since I have like fixed my issue that I kind of set up there, do I need Pixar Surface 5 anymore? No, it's a dead material. It's not even doing anything. It's not a, a connected to any object. So what should happen is if I do delete unused nodes, this should go away. You should notice it disappears. Yep, it's gone. So delete unused nodes is, that's Maya's way of just quickly scanning through the materials. It identifies which materials aren't really connected to anything and it will just delete them. Now you want to be careful because sometimes you don't want to do this. There may be a material you've made that you're just saving for later that you haven't put on anything. Be careful because if you do hit that delete unused nodes, it will delete anything that's not currently assigned. That has kind of bit me before where I had wiped something out that I didn't mean to. All right, so there we go. Let's quickly put the texture on here and check it out. So balcony material, here's my file node. We're gonna click on color, make the file. Okay, you can see the green disappeared immediately because it's no longer using that color attribute. Here's the folder. We're gonna back up because we're in the pedestal folder. We're gonna go to balcony, balcony texture. Here it is, open, boom, and it's done. This one's pretty bright, and this one's really washed out, like it's getting bleached. Probably a little bit too intense for me. So we're going to go in there and just drop down my diffuse gain just a bit, and so it feels a little more natural and balanced. Okay, and I think what I'm going to do in this case as well is I still want to add specular reflections. Now, the surface for this is supposed to be drier. I don't want it to look polished like this. This is what I think would be like a drier balcony. So I'm still going to use specular reflections because everything should have this. Um, it's not just for shiny materials. Everything should use specular reflections. So we're gonna put it up, and you're probably gonna see a couple highlights start appearing. Let me do a crop maybe on just this area so we're not wasting time rendering the whole thing. Yeah, you can kinda see um, some of the shininess. Let me turn that off. Um, right here, it's a little reflective. It's not too bad, but um, I think one thing I could do is the roughness is still down pretty low. It's That is kind of a plasticky look to it. I might go up to like 0.6 and just try to dry out the highlight. Uh, for, in this case right here, I don't think it was really that noticeable at 0.2, so it, I don't think this is changing a whole lot, but I just know this, I want a drier highlight. I'm just going to put it up and just kind of go with my instincts on that. So it, either way, this still looks fine to me right now. Okay, let's just stop the render for a second. Now what I also want to do is get a normal map connected. So let's check that out, normal map. Now to do this, this is one of the parts uh, for this activity, is you guys have made normal maps, and we want to get those connected to the material. So down here under globals, so way down near the bottom, there's something called bump. And you can see these three different channels right here. Uh, so these three attributes, which you might think of as like RGB. Uh, this is actually a coordinate system. It's X, Y, Z. Um, uh, for, it could be like a 3D bump. Uh, if it's also using like the bump, uh, sorry, the normal map, it actually is using RGB, but it's either way, it's gonna be three channels. We need to get a, uh, uh, a Pixar normal map node in here and connect that over to the material. So to the left here. This time what I'm going to do is instead of me hitting the checker box, I want to make the node first and just show you how you connect it manually. So what if we want to make the node and then try to connect it to the right attribute? So how do we do that? Well, a couple ways to do it. Um, you can do a search. So if you hit tab, this little box will pop up. This is a search box. And if you start typing in anything, I can type in file. You can see, okay, here's different things that are files. Uh, file texture, by the way, is this. That's, that's what a file texture is. Um, I could do Pixar Surface. I could make a material. Um, but in this case, we're going to do PXR Normal. And we're going to make a Pixar Normal map. Here's the Pixar Normal map. So this is a, it's a RenderMan node. Uh, this is a Maya file node, and it still works totally fine with the RenderMan material. This is a RenderMan node. 
uh, that's going to connect into the render bin material. Uh, there is a way to do normal maps with Maya nodes, but it looks awful. The one with render bin is much, much better. But either way, when you click on this, you can see it kind of looks like a file node because you can see this little folder thing right here. We need to load in a normal map. So we're going to click. And then we're going to go balcony normal texture. There's my normal map. Open. Okay, so it's in there. Now here's where it gets a little tricky. We have to connect it. So this one's a little more obvious because you can see there's like these little dots on the end where you can click on it and say, I want to take the color and put it into something. I want to take an alpha channel and connect that into something. This one's weird because you don't really see that. Now, if I click on the node and use my different number keys, like one, two, three, four, one of these actually does show what we need. If you go to three, there's this one up here called result end. That actually is the thing we need. But a lot of the times, um, yeah, three is revealing all the attributes. Here's one, two, three, four. So four is default, three just shows you everything. But a lot of the times people don't really use these to view the different attributes. They just kind of leave it in the default four setup. Now you can actually still get the right connection just by using this little white dot right here. So if you click on the white dot, this is where you can pull any of the attributes out. And the one we need is result n, which is result normal xyz. So result n, click, result n, and see how it, it's pulling that information out? It's waiting for me to connect it. Go down, bump normal. So bump normal is that attribute we saw over there on the side. So we're going to go over it and click. It'll connect. If I go back to the material, notice how that is lit up and they're showing there's an input connection. OK, let's do it again real quick. Let me, I'm going to just drag over this, hit backspace to delete it. You click, result n. Click on result n, hover over, bump normals, little dot, click, it should connect in there. So the normal map is now connected. So we're going to turn on the render. This might look really bumpy. Give it a second. This one actually might not be loaded yet. May have to get the uh, perspective up close to see this because I can't quite make it out. I think it is doing it. Some of these normal maps are really hard to see unless you do a final render. Uh, the wall might be a little more obvious, but this one's pretty difficult to see it. Let me try going to perspective and get a bit closer. Yeah, we should be able to see that it's pretty bumpy. Oh, it's definitely working. Yep, there it is. See all that little bumpy detail right there? That's the normal map. And a good way to uh, double check that is back on the normal map uh, right up here. Uh, you can see we have all these settings. This is where we loaded in the file, but there's one right here called bump scale. If I turn this to zero, watch the surface. See how it got really um, kind of flat? Let me draw the crop over that. See, so it's pretty flat. Here's default of one. So you can kind of make out all the little bumps it's adding. So it's definitely working. What we want to do is just find the right balance. To me, this is a little ridiculous. That looks a bit too chunky. So I'm going to go here and do 0 0.5. We're going to pull that back. If you go negative, um, it'll uh, invert it. So we're going to go down. I might even go a little bit lower than that, like 0.25. So I want a little bit of bumpiness, but I want this thing to feel, you know, like it's going to hurt someone if they're putting their hands on it. Um, so that looks okay to me, 0.25. Now there are a bunch of things we're going to, we could uh, talk about down here with like inverting it. Like if sometimes with, with the normal map, it's going to feel like the things that are pushing in, like there's going to be like cracks and bumps that, that stick out. Occasionally you do run into these situations where the, the detail is kind of doing the opposite of what you expected. So if there's like a crack in the wall from the normal map and it looks visually like the crack is sticking out instead of pushing in, you can simply hit invert and that will visually invert the effect of the normal map. Because all this thing is doing is faking 
surface imperfections. It's adding cracks, bumps, uh, you know, little dents, all the fun stuff that makes the model not look perfectly smooth is happening here. So we're doing it with a texture fake. So in my case, I'm kind of happy with the way it looks. I don't feel like I really need to invert it. I don't think it made a difference either way. So we're, we're getting pretty lucky with this one where I can just leave it at default. And I'm just going to click to get rid of the crop and turn off the render for a second. Okay. So that's all set. <coughs> Excuse me. So for anyone that's watching, do you guys have any questions about that? I know it's one of those where we're covering quite a bit. And so it's going to be one of those things where it's like you probably want to watch it again uh, for the recording and just kind of, you know, take your time uh, following along with it. But hopefully at least like the concepts of what I'm talking about makes sense. Like the way we're um, swapping out materials, connecting things, thinking about, you know, how do we get one material, multiple objects, uh, adding specular reflections, thinking about how dry or sharp the highlight is supposed to be. We're just developing the surface quality for the material. And we're only using really up to two textures right now. We're only doing color in a normal map. And potentially, there could be a texture in a lot of different attributes. You could have specular reflection textures. You could have roughness textures and roughness maps. There's, um, there's a, you could put maps in iridescence, scatter maps. Anything here that has a checkerbox could be a texture. So it's kind of crazy, too. If you start really going through this, you're like, damn, I could make a texture for, like, something really weird, like the clear coats Fresnel exponent. If you knew what this thing did, but my stream just died there for a second. If you knew what this thing did, you could totally make a, um, a texture that controls the way the clear coats Fresnel, you know, fall off works. I've never done it, but... You could do it. You can connect it to anything that has a checker box. So there's a lot of control. Um, all right. Let's, I'm going to do this one a little faster. We're actually getting through quite a bit. I think at this point, I'm just going to kind of do th the rest of it. Let's do the wall much faster. Now with this one, I'm going to put the wall on, let's just do this piece right here. So we're going to click. Uh, I didn't put the balcony texture on the archway. I should have, but we didn't. But I'll let you guys figure that out. I'm going to, uh, click on this, right click, picks our surface, let's rename it real fast, wall material, okay, we're going to jump in here, I'm going to clear the graph, that way I can right click on wall material and graph it separately by itself, so I don't, I don't want the balcony down there again, so this wall material, we're going to do color input, file, folder, backup, wall texture, uh, that's this. Might have, I did like an interesting kind of combo of like a gray, uh, almost like a concrete with a bunch of paint on top. So got that connected. Lovely. And we're going to come down here, Pixar normal map. I'm just quickly jumping through all this stuff a little bit faster. Okay, same connection we did before. Click, result in, result in, bump normal on the normal map. Go to the folder, balcony normal. We're going to open that up. Go to here. I'm going to add some primary specular reflections. So we're going to bump that up a little bit, bump that up halfway. I'm going to put this right in the middle just because I don't know what it looks like yet. And just like that, we probably already have the material done. Doesn't that look amazing? Such an appealing look. Um, so we have a lot of problems we have to fix with this one. And there's a, a reason why this looks the way it does. And a lot of you are going to have the exact same thing happen when you first look at this. And this is going to kind of show you actually why we, I had you guys do a couple things in 2.1. Now, technically what I've done as far as the workflow is 100% correct. I've got the texture working. It's kind of reflective. It's probably too shiny, but we'll fix that. What is the issue? Well, doesn't this kind of look like a really weird, um, like a really crappy looking water? It's very wavy, right? Something's wrong with this thing. It doesn't look very good. So here's the issue. Let's turn this off. I'm going to click on the wall, and we're going to go into uh, the UV editor. So this is the same area that you guys were in before when uh, you were exporting out uh, your UV map for the pedestal. It's the same thing again. Now, I want to back up and show you the 
whole building here real quick. So remember too, when we're viewing this with our render cam, we're only seeing this little pocket, but this is the whole thing. Now I want you to look at the UVs for this. Looking at this map, you have to kind of imagine, actually I can show you this, uh, I can get this to show you the texture. No, nope, that's not it. Oh, it's totally not going to show up. That's right. Uh, why is it not going to do it? That's weird. Normally when you click on an object, typically you can get to the texture from here. It must be because it's a render man material and for some reason it's not showing up today, but uh, usually you can see the texture. That kind of stinks. That's okay. What I want you to kind of imagine here, I'll show you what the texture looks like. Uh, here it is. It's a pretty big image, but so this is my 4K texture. Imagine that this texture is lining up right here in this box from 0 to 1. So this from here, over, up, and then down here. This little square section, imagine the texture being there. Okay, So it's covering the whole thing. This is actually why it looks terrible. Uh, so we, in the render, are seeing only this part here. This little piece, if you zoom in, if I right click and go to faces and start putting my mouse over things, that little chunk there, if you look what I'm selecting, that's the thing we're seeing in the render, right? And probably not even that much of this area above it, like a little bit of that. But we're seeing all of this. And if you start really backing up and thinking about like, okay, so with the texture, if that's all we're seeing, the entire render is capturing like, that's probably about right here in the image. So imagine take, zooming in super close, taking this small portion of the image and then blowing that up across the entire part of the wall that we're seeing. It's, that's why it looks so bad. It's just scaled up massively large. And kind of the other crappy thing about this is if this is the only part of the texture we're seeing, because that's where the UVs are for this part of the image, why did we even do all this other work? Right? We made a huge 4K texture with tons of detail. I've got like areas where the paint's chipped away. I did dirt stains and discoloration. I had a lot of stuff that went into this, and none of that's visible against that one little area. But... This is why we had you guys do a tileable texture. It's actually for this moment right now. What I want to do is make this texture repeat. So we're going to scale it down. So we're trying to make it uh, a higher frequency. Higher frequency textures just mean um, there, it, it appears more frequently visually. Like there's more of them. A low frequency texture is when they're very big and you only see maybe a few. So high frequency is many. Low frequency are few. So what I'm going to do is right mouse button down. I'm going to go to UV shell. I'm going to drag select. So marquee select over all this stuff. And what I'm going to try to do is get this pocket right here to be so big that that basically covers or is pretty close to covering almost the entire chunk of the wall. Now while I do this, I'm also going to have the render running. And notice how right now with the selection, I want to see if I can turn that off. Oh, that's not going to work. That's fine. We're just going to start the render. Um, yeah, I know it's showing you the selection. Just ignore that. But um, I want you to watch. Oh, come on. There we go. Let's try this again. Right click. Let's see if I can turn selection highlighting off. UV, it's probably still going to light up. It is. That stinks. That's all right. We're going to scale it up. All right. We're going to back up. R. And watch the image right there. So I'm trying to get this so you can actually see that. We're going to scale it up. See how the bumps are already shrinking? Right? Because we're making this bigger. It's kind of backwards from what you'd think because it's almost... If you make this bigger, I think you sort of think like, oh, if I make it bigger, the texture should be bigger. I should make it smaller to make it the texture smaller. So it's actually inverted from the way I think most people initially look at it. So bigger a UV shell means smaller texture. So we're going to go up. We're getting there. 
Let's keep going. And now part of what I'm kind of fighting is the normal map, and that's why it looks so bumpy. I'm just going to turn that off for a second because I think that's kind of hurting what we're seeing. I'm going to go to the normal map real fast and just turn that scale to zero. That's the thing I did before to just, like, completely kill the normal. Oh, there it is. That's way easier to see. Should have done that a long time ago. The normal map was way too intense. There we go. Let's try it again. Right click, UV shell. I'm going to go over all this stuff. And if I go back down, so now that you can see it a little bit better, see how big some of those like gray paint chunks are? Um, you're, at this point, really, you just want to like scale it until you think you have like the right size of detail. And even moving it around, if I just watch the texture, uh, if I kind of go down, see how it goes up? And how big that, that's that gray chunk that was in the middle. If I go up it goes down. So it's going to take a little bit. You can also rotate it, by the way, but it, it does take a little bit to um, get it to look right. So I might actually boost this up even bigger. And I want to see if I can get that gray chunk I had to hit right between the two. Yeah, kind of like that. I, I sort of like that. Go up a little bit bigger to shrink it. And we're going to release, and you can see there it is. But this looks way better than what we had earlier. May, well, part of it was a normal map because I, I totally forgot to, to drop the intensity down. That looked ridiculous. Uh, but a big thing is us scaling the UVs up way bigger. So now our texture is sitting in here, which is basically big enough to cover the almost the entire part that we're seeing. It's probably still could be even scaled down um, the texture could be shrunk down even more by scaling this up, but I think this looks okay. So really feel free to like crank this up. It's going to be different for everybody because it kind of depends what your texture looks like um, coming out of Photoshop. Everyone has like different frequencies and scales, but uh, with a little trial and error, um, you guys will eventually settle on something you like. So I'm just kind of playing around with it right now. So we'll maybe do that. I made it even bigger, uh, which shrunk down the texture even more. But it looks pretty good. But this really wouldn't be possible if I didn't make this tileable because since the texture repeats, uh, actually, if I really crank it up, you can actually see it repeat. We're going to get stupid big with this thing. Really big. So once you got, yeah, you can start to see it tile. There it is. So see that, that this is it repeating. Now, the texture is really tiny now. It's like texture, 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 texture. And this, obviously, you guys wouldn't want to do this. This is way, like, beyond what we would ever need to do. But the important part about this is if I, you know how you guys were doing all that heel brush stuff before? Where you were, like, heel brushing along, like, the edge, right? If you didn't do the heel brush, you would actually notice next, where every texture starts and stops, there would be a line because the texture doesn't blend properly into the one next to it. This is making it repeat. And I bet just by you guys seeing this right now, is this sort of bringing back like any memories of like games you've played, like um, first person shooters or uh, open world games like Skyrim, where you've actually noticed like the grass texture, you can see it repeat, like it's the same kind of chunk of you know, blades of grass that like sort of stagger themselves over and over again. You see it with like bark on trees, brick walls, um, uh, stone walls, dirt. Once you kind of know, to, once you get better at identifying textures, you will see this everywhere. This is how they do massive games. It's not like they're texturing every single, you know, foot of the of the ground with a unique texture. It's all repeating. It re it, that's what helps. A lot, it, it's what allow the games to run. Like if they didn't do this, if you had thousands and thousands of textures in the game engine, it would just never be able to run. You'd have frame rate issues. It'd be running out of memory. But because we're being creative and we're trying to figure out how do we get these textures to, to uh, tile, there's a bunch of other stuff you're going to learn too when you get to some of your later classes, like how you hide some of the tiling by using like um, uh, stencils and alphas and dirt masks and maps to like, we're almost stacking stencils and different um, textures together so they kind of blend in a certain way where you don't really notice they're repeating. There's all these other tricks you're going to figure out 
um, that'll kind of build upon this. But that's why it's all tiling. Now, obviously, what I did is not good, so we're just going to bring that down a little bit. Went a little crazy there with the repeating. Really, the texture we're trying to get is only that first square, so I don't need to crank it up too much. Yeah, we'll do something like that. That's good. Good enough for me. So it looks pretty good. And now that I, I think I'm happy with the scale, like I can totally go back there and um, turn that normal map back on. So over here, we'll maybe do... I don't want the wall to look too bumpy. Maybe I'll do like 0.25. And, and like I said, it's hard to see the normal map sometimes. I had to get really close for this one. It looked terrible at one. Uh, but if you are really struggling to see it, it might be a good idea to, like, instead of relying on this type of render, just kick off a nice high-quality one with Blue R. You know, take a break, uh, eat lunch, watch a, you know, watch a TV show. It might take a few minutes to really refine the image enough where you can see it. But that might give you a better idea kind of with what you're working with. So I do that occasionally where I need to do like a, not a high quality render, but somewhere in between our preview and the final just to get a better idea with like uh, where we're at with some of the material properties. Because the grain really does make it hard to see, especially with something like a normal map that's a pretty particular and uh, fine detail. Um, i trying to think if we really missed anything. We actually did a lot today. I did, did not think we were going to be able to do all that. Man, what did we miss? Apparently not much. We. This is actually very impressive. <laughs> Somehow crammed about two or three hours worth of videos into an hour live session. My poor voice is shot. Oh, actually, there is, sorry, there is one thing I want to show you. Um, I know we're going a little over time, but this is something kind of cool that some of you guys may want to try out. Um, in Photoshop, uh, something I've critiqued with a couple of your projects is, you know how in Photoshop you have these color adjustment layers where you can sort of change the, uh, the hue saturation value of a texture? A, a few of you are going to get in Maya, and I'm just going to sort of play devil's adv advocate right now. Let's say that you did this texture, you get inside of Maya, and I'll, I'll render it again. Um, and then you realize, okay, it's been rendering, you, you are just kind of critiquing it yourself, and maybe you're going over here and you're like, okay, well I like that, but now that I'm seeing this wall texture with the wood, maybe the wood's too bright, so maybe I'm gonna go back here and like pull the gain down. So I'm going to darken the wood a little bit. And then you start looking at it more, and you're like, well, I wonder what this would look like if it was not blue. What if I had a maroon wall, like a kind of a more of a reddish color? Like, how would that look? So you don't always have to go back into Photoshop for some of your color correction things. There is a way to do very minor color correction effects in the Hypershade. This is not required. I'm not expecting you guys to master this. If you actually do it in your Hypershade, uh, maybe mention it when you submit the project in the comments that you did it, because I, I would love to see how you connected it and like if you ended up doing this, because it's, it's kind of a cool little trick. Uh, let me kill this for a second. I We're done with the UV Editor. I'm going to go back in the Hypershade, and I want to show you how to do this. We're going to treat it just like I've done in Nuke. So for anyone that's in this lecture, in, and that's been in any of my Nuke projects, you'll remember that we did this thing called an exposure node. And the exposure node was something we had used to adjust the light's color. We were like tweaking the RGB sliders to like recolor it. That's actually really similar to what we're about to do in the Hypershade. It, it's kind of cool knowing that some of the same concepts we do in Nuke really do apply uh, inside of Maya. So how do we do that? Well, we got the file node. And you can see how the, the file node with our wall texture is just taking the color. It's going right into the walls to fuse color. It's like a direct connection. What would happen if I dropped something here, though? What if I said, I want the file node to be color corrected. I want to change the color. So it's almost like dropping something in here to modify the image, the texture before it makes it to color. So it's loading the image change it a little bit, like do something like, like you would in Photoshop, change it, take the result of the change texture, then that goes in here. 
So it's just you're inputting something else in between this connection. Here's how we do it. I'm going to hold tab and I'm going to type in remap. Uh, I, there's a couple of them actually. Pixar remap is kind of interesting. Uh, there's a Pixar remap. Um, this one's more for like um, changing your zero to one range of colors, like black to white. It's also called like, um, uh, like it's kind of similar to levels in Photoshop, uh, like uh, white point, black point, lift, gain, uh, gamma. We're not going to do that. We're going to do remap and pick this one called remap HSV. Oh, by the way, I know I was using this tab thing and typing stuff in. If you're kind of curious where these are coming from, I can't not believe I forgot to show you this. This is coming from the creation window. And when you tab stuff, if you actually want to like dig through the nodes and just see what's in here instead of just typing randomly until you ha happen to stumble across something, uh, hold your right mouse button down and go up to create node. This is where I'm, I'm pulling all these things from that I'm typing in. Like the remap HSV, for example, is a Maya utility. And if you scroll down, uh, you'll see it in here somewhere. There's remap HSV. Uh, there's 2D file right there. Under render man, uh, BXDF, there's the Pixar surface. Uh, under their pattern, somewhere in here is the Pixar normal map. Uh, there's a normal map. So it's a ton of stuff we're not talking about. I mean, there's a stupid amount of nodes in here. Um, but that's, I'm just typing it in because I know what I'm looking for. But if you ever want to go digging through stuff, you can totally like use the right click and start just creating things and seeing what they are. And I've honestly haven't used half the stuff in the Hypershade yet. I've been using Maya for years and I don't think I've even touched half the nodes. I just don't know what they're, what they even do. Um, so the trick here is how do I get this to be here? I want to take the color, go into here. The result of this goes into here. So it's actually very easy color remap color input so this is the output of the file into the input of the remap here's the remaps node there's a couple things we're going to do in here now if i change something at this point will i see it in the render no why is that what is the material pulling from does the material know that this even exists it does not because what is the material using for its color just follow your eye back to the left. It is pulling from the files diffuse color, or the files uh, out color. Diffuse color from out color. Th while this is connected into something, and we could change a bunch of settings, because this isn't going anywhere, the material's still not going to understand to do anything with it. This is kind of how node editing works. I need the result of this to go into the diffuse color. I hope my stream is still working because it looks like it is freaking out on my end. Hold on a second. I gotta refresh it. Hopefully you guys can still see me. <laughs> it looks like it's not working too well. I'm gonna take the out color and we're gonna drag it down to diffuse color, which is overriding the connection. Now this is our new layout. File to remap color adjustment to material. And if I start the render, um, it's not gonna look like much yet because I haven't changed by default the remap doesn't do anything I have to move something for it to change but watch this we're gonna go in there click on the remap let's just move this out of the way um, and uh, we have some very similar things that you guys have seen before like Photoshop hue saturation value I want to change the color that is hue so I'm gonna hit this little arrow here to pop that little guy out in a bigger format so this is actually it's a really stupid way they display it, so you're gonna have to pardon Autodesk's, uh, I guess, way they're visualizing how Hue works. I, I'm much, I kind of much prefer um, the Hue wheel. Let me sh show you this real quick. I kind of like this Hue, where you're just sliding through something like a 360 wheel over this weird curve uh, thing they're doing here. It is the same thing, but it's just, I don't know. It's the way it is. Someone at Autodesk thought this was a brilliant way to display color. I don't know why, but it's the way it is. All right, so uh, what I'm going to do, there's a point up here. You can't really see it, but if I move this around, watch. Yeah, see how it's changing? So it's really hard to like know what it's going to do, but if you just kind of slide it around, you can kind of And every time I slide them, it's like unclicking, so it just updates the render quicker. Right, so now if it gets kind of touchy, 
shift into yellows eventually. And I think if I keep going, it will start to cycle over into green, and eventually it'll probably reset back to blue again. Uh, this is kind of interesting, too, because we're getting almost a clamped effect for the hue, where this is almost causing it to have, like, color variation. Um, whoa. That's pretty funky. That's cool. Neat. Um, yeah, we don't need to do that, but I could also go down. So it's a little bit of trial and error with this thing. Uh, we can kind of come down this way, see what that does. So it's... As long as you know to move this little end point around, eventually you might stumble across something that kind of works. So I think right around here I had something I was kind of digging. Like around, let's do that possibly, like a little warmer. Yeah, we'll do that. I'm going to close out. Saturation. And it's just saturation. I'm going to try to move this over. Come on. There we go. I can make it richer. I can even go down here to value and bring this down and make it darker. Close that out. It's pretty cool though, right? So we're changing the color um, with some color correction. It's, I'm not saying it's the most, the easiest way to do it because this is definitely kind of difficult to wrap your mind around when you're trying to look at it, update in the, in the, uh, the viewport, but it's still pretty cool seeing it. Um, you could play around with that for your texture if you just want to have fun and see about doing some basic color adjustments. Or if you prefer it, obviously go back into Photoshop, do some color correction in there, save the texture back out, load it in Maya, and you're good to go. So now that's probably everything I wanted to show you. Uh, so do you guys have any questions about that stuff? Uh, let me know. Whoops, we're going to save this part two. That way we can pick up on this again next week, and we're going to do part three. And uh, next week, in case you're curious, uh, Part of the week is a discussion. We're going to be uh, going into a breakdown of how the different properties work, like diffuse, specular reflections, diffuse and specular transmissions, like glass. And then at the end of the week, in week three, uh, you will be adding like glass windows, bottles, doing a bunch of cool gemstones, adding some more lights. So it's really going to start picking up here um, and kind of going into week four. You'll almost be done with this thing uh, right before you do your final presentation for the whole project. So it should be cool. Hopefully this was helpful for everybody, uh, but that's going to be it for me today. Uh, thanks for every, everyone hanging out with me, and I'll post the link to you guys tomorrow. Check your LMS messages. Uh, you'll have the YouTube recording you can check out, and uh, I will catch up with you guys either uh, tomorrow or next week. Everybody have a good night.